Good evening and welcome uh, to Point Blank uh, here at KTN News. And we are shooting from the Nairobi Serena. When the locust invasion, described as one of the worst that has happened in the last 70 years, hit the Horn of Africa, starting with the Somalia, Ethiopia, Congo and Uganda, within the environs of Kenya and Kenya herself, it has been described as a really something of global concern, beginning from the Yemen. Why and how has this been coming just now, since 1955? 1928 was the first recorded major locust invasion in Kenya, from Turkana to the Kiriu Valley to Transoya and the Wasingishu Plateau, the desert locust swarms, the most destructive of all food-eating locust species, wrote havoc, devastating fields of maize, wheat, millet and sugarcane crop with their ravenous appetite before heading to Tanzania. The invasion continued well into the 1930s, with more parts of the Kenyan colonial territory experiencing their wrath. According to colonial records, Nyanza lost 70% of its crop, followed by Nzoia at 50% and Rift Valley at 25%. Vast tracts of grazing land were also disseminated by the indiscriminate army. Famine was the inevitable consequence. The January 2020 desert locust swarm is the worst in Kenya, indeed the Horn of Africa, in 70 years, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization. Climate change, including the unusually heavy rains at the end of last year, created ideal conditions for the pest precipitous breeding. The action plan to combat the menace that has so far been seen in more than 20 counties has been hampered by the government's total attention to containing the spread of the coronavirus that has swept across the globe with devastating speed. This past week, large swarms have been spotted in Nakuru, Samburu, Laikipia and Nyandarua counties, dangerously coinciding with the traditional planting season of late March and early April. They are in the forest and on the farms, raising real fear of not only a potential human-wildlife conflict, but a crippling food crisis. If the second wave of desert locusts are not dealt with effectively, famine and destruction will be the next plague that already overburdened Kenyans will be faced with. These are unprecedented times. The world is at war with a strain of virus that has spread as shockingly fast as it came to light. The Cabinet Secretary for Health, Mutahi Kagwe, has been at the forefront of keeping his fellow citizens informed as to the status of the virus in Kenya. His message, indeed the whole government's, particularly after closing all learning institutions in an effort to contain the virus spread, has been stay at home. The partial lockdown has been guided by irrefutable empirical data from the original China epicenter of the virus and now the Italian distress. Consider this. Just over a month ago, the European nation recorded five coronavirus cases with no fatalities. The Italian government, though, issued a stay-home order to its citizens, which they defied, continuing business and personal life as usual. Today, in 30 days, Italy has confirmed over 60,000 cases and 5,400 deaths from COVID-19. It is the epicenter of the virus. The partial Kenyan and global lockdown, while right, will greatly interfere with both government and private sector efforts to manage the dreaded locust swarms that invaded the country early in the year. Agriculture Principal Secretary Hamadi Boga in a status report released this week, spoke to the challenges to importing chemicals used to fight the menace with importers experiencing delays due to the breakdown in the global supply chain. Despite the government setting aside 500 million Kenyan shillings to combat the menace, the PS pointed to logistical challenges such as inadequate control equipment and surveillance and spraying aircraft. More important, with the social ban in place, the 30 Masters of Trainers plan that was to start this week has been put on hold, meaning 
There are no boots on the ground necessary to tackle the imminent second locust wave that could wipe out Kenya's entire crop. This represents an unprecedented threat to the nation's food security and its Kenyans' well-being. Will the Jubilee administration be able to effectively curtail what all experts are calling a potentially devastating second locust wave, given that the administration has just this week requested a rescue bailout from the World Bank and IMF of 115 billion Kenya shillings to help the already battered Kenyan business grapple with the COVID-19 repercussions? Tonight we have the alternative view. We have Professor John DeRito from the School of Agriculture in the University of Nairobi. And we have businessman Peter Kogoro, who of Kogoro Industries, both of whom are discussing in, 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 in their own way how we could have dealt better with the locust invasion. Now, before I get into either of them, what has John DeRito done before? John Hurian Derito is an agricultural entomologist and currently holds the position of Professor in Agriculture Entomology at the University of Nairobi. He previously served as the university's Dean, Faculty of Agriculture, from 2006 to March 2010. In 2010, Derito joined the Mount Kenya University as the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic Affairs as well as research and development. Professor Nderito holds a Bachelor Education Science and a Master's Agricultural Entomology from the University of Nairobi and a PhD in Agricultural Entomology from the University of Dar es Salaam. He has memberships in various scientific organizations including the African Association of Insect Scientists, the Agricultural Council of Kenya, and the Desert Locust Multi-Institutional Team. After Derito, one must ask, what has businessman Peter Koguru done before? Peter Koguru is the founder and CEO of Koguru Food Complex Limited, the farm that established Softer Bottling Company in 1998, which for a while offered competition to global soft drinks giant Coca-Cola. Following his return to Kenya, having graduated from Massey University with a bachelor's degree in food technology in 1972, Kuguru ventured into the catering and baking business by fast producing potato chips in his home kitchen. His big break came when he acquired the license to produce South African sorghum beer, Chibuku, which until then had been produced by transnational giant Lonho. Kuguru, one of the founders of the Kenya Bureau of Standards, has progressed from beverage production to the manufacturing of animal feeds, plastics, sanitary pads and diapers. I want to ask you from the beginning to look at the rear view mirror. Give a synopsis if you can, a bird's eye view of when we talk locusts, when we talk invasion, what is the modern history of the locust invasion here and around the world? Um, if you look at uh, locust uh, history in this country, it started, they came here in 1928 during the colonial times and they were here 30th and also 40th all those decades they were here in big masses and they were big threat to colonialists because uh, out of biographies they have written they have indicated some of them left this country because of rockers so it's a serious pest. It went from that time, and they fought seriously by even leasing all the workers. They were workers and also their uh, workers in the farms to fight locusts, either physically or by firebombs. And it went all along until in the late uh, 40s when the new insecticides 
came in and they were able to fight strongly the low caste menace in 1948. That is the time we had the highest population of low caste and the, uh, the really what we can say the highest. But in the 50th, 1950, up to 1955, we had small local uh, locus uh, invasion in this country. So let me go back for the layman to understand. Um, before uh, modern pesticides uh, were available to spray and contain, you were saying that um, East Africa or Kenya particularly, uh, which, what was it? When you say that there was a menace here that even made the colonialists, some of them leave Kenya. Kenyans who are younger, uh, some who may not be aware, of what happened in the 20s, 28, 1928, you say, mm -hmm. 55. What made uh, Kenya a harbor uh, that would attract the swarms of locusts? Uh, locusts uh, uh, normally are attracted uh, or moved by weed. And when the environment also is conducive for food availability, where they are going. So they came uh, all the way from Asia, and they moved, uh, or Arabs uh, country, and they came here because there were favorable environmental conditions, the temperature, the rainfall, and also the food resource out of the good uh, rainfall. So um, for the layman again, uh, international names have been given to different types of locusts. This particular menace that we are facing currently and had faced in the 50s, uh, I think the last one, 55, they're calling them de de desert locusts. Why the word desert locust? And where does it originate from? You, you talk about Asian countries. This particular origin is being pinned down to the airmen. Why, let us understand a bit more from your point of view, why is it a desert locust? Uh, uh, locust, uh, uh, as I have said, they are mainly desert locust. They are mainly in two forms. One is solitary, when they are scattered in small populations in the areas where they are resident. It's only when the environment builds in terms of temperature, in terms of rainfall, in terms of weed direction, that they build in big forces because they have had, they have had enough food and they come together and move from that area, being able to fly long distances. They are long distance flyers. They move from that area and they migrate to East Africa. So, uh, Professor uh, Derito, these locusts then find lack of food, uh, have the energy to start their flight, and they go in swamps. Uh, I'm trying to put this in mm -hmm. some logical order. So they go in swamps of about 50,000, etc. but there are tens of thousands, if not millions, in one invasion. For people, what's an invasion? Is it uh, several swamps, uh, you know, are going through at once? So, for example, what hit East Africa was several swamps of locusts. Is it that they are um, uh, traveling together or they lay eggs? How, how, do, how do they travel, for example, the distances from Yemen up to Kenya? Are they the same ones that left Yemen that landed here? Um, when they build in Yemen, uh, because that's where they are normally solitary, and they build to gregaria fields, big masses. Now, because of the age, is that they can reach such an age, a certain population moves up from Yemen and now flies to the uh, countries in Africa, uh, especially North Africa and uh, our region. They fly in various swamps. It's not only one big swamp that they fly. They fly depending on maturity of different, uh, because they may not lay the eggs all at once. Different populations you build up in the original area. So they keep on flying in swarms of different sizes. So in, if you, as a researcher uh, at the university and from the, what you saw now, um, they have landed. We heard that Somalia was the first. They're coming. They began from Garissa and the northeast of the country until now they went to different parts. First of all, were we prepared uh, as a nation when we heard that they were coming? Are you comfortable with how government dealt with them? And if not, how would you describe um, 
our preparedness, uh, our response? And how would you also uh, describe um, the way or age? Uh, did they leave eggs uh, along the way? Um, so that from the journey to Yemen to now, uh, could you go through that and tell us where we are now? Of course, uh, it was reported to us by uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of United Nations that uh, the locusts will be here by 28th of December. And they were here on the wave from Somali and also from Ethiopia. Um, of course, we were alerted through alerts so that we can be prepared that they are coming. When you are alerted like that, they are in, supposed to be both human, financial resources that must be put in place. Any delay of any of those creates a good condition for them to move and lay eggs, and that's what happened. Any small delay that may have been caused within one day is that they are able to land somewhere, and before they move, they have already laid eggs, and they lay eggs in millions. So, so go ahead. So what I am asking, and, and I, from that journey, and the age which they left and the age they laid eggs, do you think that Kenya was not prepared or prepared? And, and you are saying we were not prepared. We definitely uh, requires a very rapid response that may have some delay because of financial resources, because of the human preparedness, and because of also this season. That was also a season of most of our, our season of, or, or, or this is normally people are not in offices. Mm. The issue of human resource and financial, especially financial, we require financial resources. So I, I do think that there was a time lapse, and that time lapse is what we may suffer for the incoming generation. Okay, so a professor of locust. All right, so we, we, that's interesting. So to the first phase, if you call it first phase, mm -hmm. uh, that hit us, what damage, before we talk about the next generation, uh, have they now passed our territories? And to your knowledge, what was the damage that they, 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 they wrecked in Kenya? Uh, we got swarms, that means we got uh, the young adults, and we also got um, uh, mature adults that were flying in swamps. Those uh, swamps were particularly also landing and flying to different regions. And uh, we have not had a serious, serious uh, damage, maybe in specific uh, um, um, farms, but in overall, it may not be that extremely high. The, the first phase? The first phase. But, so your concern, and what you're telling Point Blank, what you're telling KTN News, is that the worst is to come if, I want to come now to what you're calling the second phase. So the first phase has gone. Yes. Are they out of our territory, the first phase? Uh, we are likely to have even a predicted more than 20 times what we have seen flying in our country because they read the eggs, and currently the eggs have started hushing. So now there are young, uh, uh, young uh, nymphs, hoppers that we are seeing in areas where they started. That should be our biggest worry. The biggest worry is those ones, that if we don't contain them on time, that's the time they reach the country into a plague level. So I want to talk to you about that, and uh, I want to talk to you point blank. A professor, normally academics are trained to be cautious with their words uh, and cautious to government, but this is something you, you cannot be cautious. So to the extent of your experience, to the extent of your knowledge, um, there at the School of Agriculture at the University of Nairobi, you are saying several million eggs 
were laid in the territories of Kenya and the environs, even neighboring countries. And you're saying that hatching is ongoing. When are you seeing uh, this danger happening? We predict that by the end of this month, when there are many areas that will be planting, if the season continues the way we are seeing, we are likely to have serious problem by the end of March, April, May and June. It will be critical times to look at and be able to be um, um, ready for a lot of problems. So, Professor, let's talk about ready. Uh, I would want to use the word preparedness. I want to talk about the skill base uh, in terms of our personnel and about the equipment that we may or may not have. So when you talk about preparedness, it has those elements, all of them, interrelated and interdependent. So let us first of all talk about um, when you say, um, are we prepared? There was all the statements by the ministry about importation of chemicals, pesticides, etc. To your knowledge, are the quantities of pesticides, what you've had or been involved with, um, do you know that we have enough coming in or prepared for? Um, we have, of course, uh, many methods. One is chemicals, which we must put in uh, big quantities. That is one. We must also look at application equipment that we have both all types of equipment that are known to be good for um, spraying chemicals in the field. Chemicals that are safe and equipment that are, will deliver the light dosage in for uh, the pest. Uh, both airborne and, 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 and ground? Both airborne and ground. But, but so your question or your concern is the quantity of chemicals. Yes. Uh, the correct equipment. Let me ask something about the skill base, because there was this idea that government was training some people in the National Youth Service, some people in, you know, in, in the normal uh, administrative uh, capacity of government. Is this the right way? Do we have a shortage? Um, are they involved in some of you? at the universities, etc.? Do you think we have the people who know what they're doing? Because obviously, if you spray badly, it's a waste of chemical and also a waste of containment. Uh, do people know what they're doing? Um, in all the East African region, people are trying to get the manpower. And uh, of course, uh, the manpower they can be the youth trained. It may not require a lot of training, maybe, because they are, especially those people who come from uh, rural areas, they're already spraying for other crops. This is not a special pest. It's a question of getting the type of sprayers, if it's a ULV sprayers, and they are trained on how to do uh, the spraying. So strictly, uh, if you engage the youth in rural areas and have the spray teams, it's not something unusual to them. They have been spraying crops, and it's only a question of being able to train them. And I think training is going on, and in very big uh, numbers, that if they get the numbers that we are expecting for the hoppers, they will be able to be scattered in the area with the sprayers. So because we are an agri-based agri economy, with agri-based um, um, uh, uh, maneuvers, uh, commonly for everything else. You think that Kenya might uh, have the uh, ability to actually overcome this because what to Amezoya, Mambo ya kutumia dawa, sa upika wadudu wa wakahawa, wa So long as the financial component, whether emergency funds from the county of the national government is a failed, this human population is enough to be able to attack this pest, whether physically, whether chemically, or whichever way we can be able to handle this pest, we have the human capacity in the rural areas. And they can be trained as fast as possible. So your message today to the country, a Professor, is that the government must be ready now with the financial resources 
and must be ready to use the counties. Because what I'm, I'm hearing from you is one, money, but also the distribution of that money. And with devolution, we have county governments. I'm asking that because what role can be played by the national government to interface with the county governments for preparedness? Is this something that you would call upon an integrated approach between the two arms of our governments? Um, Desa Locus is a cross border, a transboundary pest. That is the law of the national government, first and foremost. Because it is not a county, it's not a farm level. And in fact, it's an international pest, even the United Nations now. They are on their way to come and try to support the nation. And we have regional bodies of nine countries, like Desert uh, Locust Control Organization of Eastern Africa. So we require the national government to take in charge and coordinate all the individual, regional, county, national, and union bodies to be able to fight successfully. So it is at that core level. So they must factor in money. It must be the coordination to the highest level in the country. It cannot be left to the county. But the county can provide the manpower they have because Agriculture is a devoted function. The extension, sta sta uh, the extension staff are within the county. They can be able to direct the spray, but they let the law also be from the national government. Professor, when you look at uh, the guys or men and women, Kenyans watching you tonight, many of them will be asking identification. How do I know? You know, <laughs> Minister Kinjuri became infamous about telling people to take a, a picture and send it. But in terms of in a serious note, how will communities and populations identify trouble areas so that they can communicate that information to help coordinate better? Is there something that physically manifests itself? Or are normal farming communities in Kenya able just to see that, that, that uh, germination um, of the eggs into younger uh, locust populations? Both the immature stages or hoppers and also adults are in massive numbers more than any other population of insects we know. The adults swarm and they are in groups that the farmers even currently they call people in the area when they see them. They are not in any way making any, 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 any mistake. Of, they are not I, invisible. No, they are not invisible. They are running there in, in numbers to scare them and to see them. So there is anywhere they land, especially the swamps, they are able to appear there and notice them. And they are not in, noticeable in the area. I've been in those areas. You can just see people coming. And of course, the hoppers, you see them in big masses. So there is no confusion. Of course, there are grasshoppers issue, but definitely, currently, wherever the areas they have been able to land, we have been able to identify, and farmers are not, they, they, they are literate. And therefore, if they are literate, why are they not being spread now? Uh, is it a period that comes that they need to be spread? Or should it be happening as we speak? It is a rapid response, which I mentioned. Systems must be put that you start immediately, you see them. And that variability of the chemical, the presence of coordination, the presence of equipment, you know, transporting them there. All those are coordinated aspects that must be done in a very high level. This is like, you know, it's a way when you have a fight, uh, even between one country or another, this is an enemy we have, and we must put all preparedness and all systems go. The vehicles must be bought, the sprayers must be here on good time, because the moment they will appear later, they may not be as effective as when we have aligned defense. We know like a defense, this is a defense. We defend ourselves before they come. And when they come, it must be an emergency. We must take it seriously.
Well, uh, you're watching uh, Point Blank at KTN News. Professor John Derito says, uh, Kenya, the nation is at war with an evading army of locusts. And he says right now, we have the advantage because as an agricultural economy, we have people out there who are used to controlling pests in the normal way, but they need sprayers, vehicles, and they need a lot of coordination from government to stop this invasion before it becomes airborne and becomes the second phase. He says it will be 20 times bigger than what came before. You're watching Point Blank. It's KTN News.